Okay, so let's go ahead uh, and, and start to this class. Um, right, uh, if you can, can you see me on my web camera? So can you see me waving at you? You can see that wave back at me. You can see me waving to you at the camera wave back at me. Um, next, okay, so are you able to see my desktop screen? So can, if you can see my desktop screen, then uh, go ahead and nod your head to let me know that you can see my desktop screen. Can you see my desktop screen? Okay, so if you can hear me, hear my voice loud and clear, can you give me a thumbs up so that I can see, I can hear, okay, so you can hear me, good. Okay, good. Um, so I've dropped a copy of the notes for those of you who don't have a copy of the textbook because you are, you are a J2 student crashing the J1 class or you if you are here for a trial lesson. So I've dropped a copy of the notes here so you can just copy and paste this into your browser to download the, the notes for today. For um, our J1, J2 students, your notes are always available on our learning management system actually, so you can actually refer to it here if you want to. Okay, so uh, if, if not, then I think let's, let's go ahead and start. Let's go ahead and start today's class, which I think should be um, on market failure. Today is uh, market failure lesson 2. We are specifically covering information failure. Now, um, I will need your web cameras to be on and your micro microphones to be off, your web cameras to be on, if we cannot verify identity, we cannot let you stay in the room. So um, for if for some reason you cannot turn on your web camera, please uh, please drop uh, Jie Shi uh, direct, a, a private message. Drop Jie Shi a private message and um, verify your identity through some other means. Jie Shi, can you go and uh, verify the identity of students who do not have a web camera? Okay, right. Uh, if not, then let's go ahead and start today's class. Right, let me move this. To the side. Okay, right. Um, today we are going to start the lesson with um information failure, and I thought, so I, I was I was doing up the slides for this yesterday. I I I didn't use back the 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 previous year slides. If you want to take a look at previous year slides, you can go and download it from the learning management system. This is a new, very new set of slides. Um, we have something that's very new, so I thought I'll show you this video. Okay, yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna show you guys this video, right? So let's just watch this for a bit. Within the conditions we've tested today, the virus in droplets of saliva survives best in indoors and dry conditions. The virus does not survive as well in droplets of saliva, and that's important because a lot of testing being done is not necessarily being done, number one, with the COVID-19 virus, and number two, in saliva or respiratory fluids. Yeah. And thirdly, the virus dies the quickest in the presence of direct sunlight under these conditions. And when I look at that chart, look at the aerosol as you breathe it. You put it in a room, 70 to 75 degrees, 20% humidity, low humidity. Uh, it lasts, the half-life is about an hour. But you get outside and it cuts down to a minute and a half. Very significant difference uh, when, it, when it gets hit with UV rays. Mr. President, while there are many unknown links uh, in the COVID-19 transmission chain, we believe these trends can support practical decision making to lower the risks associated with the virus. If I could have my next slide, and when that, while that comes up, you'll see a number of some practical applications. For example, increasing the temperature and humidity of potentially contaminated indoor spaces appears to reduce the stability of the virus. And extra care may be warranted for dry environments that do not have exposure to solar light. We're also testing disinfectants, readily available. We've tested bleach, we've tested isopropyl alcohol on the virus, specifically in saliva or respiratory fluids. And, and I can tell you that bleach will kill the virus in five minutes, isopropyl alcohol will kill the virus in 30 seconds, and that's with no manipulation. No rubbing, just spraying it on and leaving it go. You rub it and it goes away even faster. We're also looking at other uh, disinfectants, specifically looking at the COVID-19 virus in saliva. So, supposing we hit the body with a tremendous, uh, whether it's ultraviolet or just very powerful light, and I think you said that has been checked, have you going to test it? And then I said, supposing you brought the light inside the body, which you can do either through the skin or uh, in some other way. And I think you said you're going to test that too. Sounds interesting. Right, and then I see the disinfectant where it knocks it out in a minute, one minute. And is there a way we can do something like that? Uh, by injection inside or almost a cleaning? Because you see it gets on the lungs and it 
does a tremendous number of work, so it'd be interesting to check that so that you don't have to use medical vouchers. But, but it sounds it sounds interesting to me. And so we'll see. But the whole concept of the light, the way it goes in one minute, that's uh, that's pretty powerful. Hey there, I'm Chris Hayes from MSNBC. Thanks for watching MSNBC on YouTube. If you want to keep up to date with the videos we're putting out, you can. All right. Uh... I, I, I don't know whether you 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 um have have thought about the implications of this message. Um so so this President Donald Trump he's he's saying he's saying this as a suggestion, he's saying as a suggestion to he said that um can can can, can we perhaps try, you know, injecting this disinfectants or injecting this alcohol. Right? So that is that is actually what he suggested. Okay, I'm I'm sure that the um I I'm I'm sure none of you are not, uh, that dumb, right? You 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 know that that in, you could die from injecting disinfectants or alcohol into your bloodstream, right? I'm sure I'm sure you you are you are fully aware of that and you know that, right? You you do, right? Okay, but um the the problem here is that uh not not everybody has the propensity to think or understand. Right. Um, what would happen if you did that? So, um, this is actually pretty scary because the I the the guess here is that there will be people who try. There be, there will be people who try thinking that well you know if if this is what the president is saying um this is 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 okay to try then maybe we should try it. Okay. So, um, this is actually the perfect example of how. Uh, misinformation could potentially and possibly be spread, okay, causing people to do things that don't quite make sense, and that's actually what what one thing that we're gonna cover today, okay. Within so, the so, um, here here are a few things that um we are gonna explore today. Uh, some of them, okay, we we try to explore all of them if we can, because they're quite fun to explore, right? Uh, so so. The the first one is actually um how many of y'all actually wear specs? I mean I mean that means that uh you have uh you have you have astic or you have myopia. Hands up. How many of you do wear do wear specs? It means you don't have perfect eyesight, so you don't have perfect eyesight, hands up. Okay, so uh so how many of you you actually consider going for LASIK? You're you're considering going for LASIK at some point? Anyone? Uh, I see one, I see two, two, only two, three. Okay, so I see three students considering going for LASIK. Okay, so we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that later if we have time. Uh, next, uh, how many of you, you use essential oils? If you even know what I'm talking about at home. Okay, how many of you, your parents or your family members are users of essential oils? Like, uh, essential oil is a thing for them. Hands up. Anybody? One, uh, two, okay, hands down. Right, um, so, so later when we have time, we will talk about this as well. Okay, these are all very interesting things to talk about. This is super, super interesting to talk about, but I'll, I'll, I'll hold you in suspense for a while. Huh? And uh, have, you, have you gotten a flu vaccination in the last 12 months? How many of you have gotten a flu vaccination in the last 12 months? One, two, anybody else? Three, I saw three, four hands, I saw four hands. Okay, only four hands. We have how many students today? 30. So four hands out of 30, well, that's not, that's not a lot. That's, that's, that's about less than a, uh, one, one, one fifth you know, than, than the, of the whole cohort today. So not many people got through vaccination. Next, uh, in the last three days, okay, so maybe your parents are not there also. Um, in the last one week then, in the last one week, how many of your grandparents went to the wet market or supermarket, hands up? Grandparents, uh, so they, 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 don't need, they don't need to be staying with you, so if you know of the fact that they were going to the wet market or supermarket, hands up. Let me count, uh. one, two, three, four, okay, so about five. Then next, the last one, right, uh, how many of you have a Dyson fan at home? You have a Dyson fan at home, one, Two. Okay, two of you have a Dyson fan. Okay, good, right. So uh later we're gonna discuss some of this. We're gonna discuss some of this. It's, 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 it's gonna be pretty interesting. So we'll come back to this slide later and let's further our understanding in the econs first. Then later when we have more knowledge and understanding of econs, 
okay, specifically to information failure. Then we're going to come back and revisit this slide and talk about, you know, how some of these decisions might end up being uh, not so great decisions. Okay, um, let's let's start first with one that, that um, I, I will talk about every single year, which is the case of flu vaccinations. All right. So um, with regards to flu vaccinations, okay, um, the problem with flu vaccinations, as you can see, is that although flu vaccinations are a good thing, it, it doesn't mean that everybody will automatically go and go for a flu vaccination. Like, um, I, I don't even I don't recall whether I've had a flu vaccination in the last twelve months, but I'm quite sure I did have one in the, within the last eighteen months. Right, so but um, it wouldn't have been effective already because by right you should have been, you should get flu vaccination within uh, every twelve months, once every twelve months because the strains of flu that 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 circulate every every year is different. Right, so um, you 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 probably don't go for flu vaccinations on your court because just now I saw only like a couple of hands were uh, raised for flu vaccinations. Okay, let, let's examine why 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 is it that people don't quite go for flu vaccination? It's actually part of this decision making framework that, that we, we, we all participate in on an almost daily basis when we decide to do something. Okay, so why do we not go for flu vaccination? Now this uh, are associated with the costs and benefits associated with going for flu vaccination like for example what? Uh, your cost for going for flu vaccination is the time taken to go to the clinic. Okay, the cost will also be actually your waiting time. Uh, nowadays going to a clinic, your waiting time can last for as long as an hour. I mean, this is pre-COVID. Uh, no, don't talk about uh, COVID now. Uh. So um, the price of flu vaccination, it, it will cost you about what? 50, 60 bucks minimally. Uh, if you don't go to polyclinic, uh, the, the cost of the flu vaccination will be 50 to 60 dollars. And then of course, some of you, how many of you are, are scared of needles? Hands up. That, that, that is that's one, two, three. Okay. So some of you are scared of needles. Right, and then the your benefits um, associated with a flu vaccination is that you have reduced likelihood of getting flu and uh, better health. So um, based on that, okay, this cost and benefit analysis, okay, we already have our answers. This time you already raised your hands, like four or five hands uh, raised, and then the rest of the class didn't raise their hands. So um, the, the bulk of the class didn't go for flu vaccination. A very, very small percentage of the class went for flu vaccination. Now, um, I'm, I'm going to explain to you this. Um, before I go on to the diagram, I'm going to explain to you this. Now, uh, let's, say, let's say this. Uh, let's, let's, do, let's do a calculation. Uh. Let's put a value to it. Okay, let's, try to put, let's try to put a value to it. How much would okay? So Okay, um, if don't, don't answer the poll yet, let me explain this to you. Uh. This question is a hypothetical question. You are sick, you are not feeling well. If I tell you, you pay this amount of money, straight away, you will be well. So you are feeling very miserable, your, feet, your, your, your nose, is, nose is stuffy, you are like sneezing, you are holding a tissue, and then you are feeling quite hot, you are sick, you generally feel unwell. And I told you that, okay, right, I can straight away improve your condition if you pay this amount of money. How much would be the amount of money that you'll be willing to pay to be well for one day? So, so how much on a daily basis you are willing to pay to be okay, to be fine? You, you, can, you can put... So yeah, you, you're just generally feeling quite unwell, okay? You're, you're having the flu, you're having fever, you're, you're, you're sneezing, and um, you're generally feeling unwell, okay? So um, you can put your value to it. 
So let's 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 let's, let's wait for the voting to finish. Huh? Okay, let's let's take the majority vote lah. The majority vote is that you're willing to pay thirty dollars, okay, to be well. Now, um, generally speaking, right? So a course of flu, right? Infection, right? With the most heavy symptoms, typically lasts over a course of about four days. Okay, typically lasts. So a flu lah, a flu infection with the most heavy sy symptoms being manifested, will typically last for about four days. Okay, so if, if you are willing to pay $30, okay, or for each day of being well, that means to say that you value your wellness at the total value of $30 times 4, $120. So you value your wellness at $120. So if you value your wellness at $120 and the chances of you getting flu on a yearly basis is actually quite high, it is almost like, it, it's almost like an inevitable, it's an inevitable event. No? So... I, I, I don't know how many of you like can go throughout the entire without catching the flu once. I think that's quite tough. I think you at least catch it once. Then you actually ca catch a respiratory virus once every year. So that's four days of downtime. So four days of downtime, the value to you, the four days of downtime is valued at $30. Okay, so we see that some people only value at $10. So the, the, the students who value at $10, hands up. So can I have a show of hands, the students who value your, your, your day of wellness at $10? Can I see, please? Can I see the show of hands? Okay, now um, let's change this, this day to the day that you're taking your A-level examinations. So I repeat, uh, we change this day that you're sick okay, to the day of the A-level examinations. How? Would that, would that, change, would that change your answer? It will change your answer, right? It, the, the problem with, with catching a flu is that you, you don't know when you're going to get it. It can be within a cost for entire, of entire year and you don't know when you're going to get it. So you get it on a typical day, you may value your health at $10, but you get it on the day that you know you are taking some, some major examination, then you will, you will value it way more than $10. So now, so because of this, um, we, I, I will actually say this, I will actually say that um, number one, actually the fact here is that everybody should go for flu vaccination because um, if you go for flu vaccination at a poly polyclinic, it's, it's actually not very expensive, that's one. And then two is that a lot of people don't know that you can go for flu vaccination and use your, um, if, if I'm not mistaken, you can use your Medisafe or your parents' Medisafe to pay for flu vaccination, so there's no upfront cost. Alright, so actually everybody should be going for flu vaccination, but very, very small proportion of the population goes for flu vaccination. Why? Okay, so imperfect information because of an underestimation of these benefits of healthcare, of healthcare services like prevention of illnesses in the future and a healthier body. Like, so um, a lot of you, so at, at the very least, eight of you, 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 you value your health at $10 a day. Okay, but so this is a perceived benefit. Your actual benefit could be, could be, I'm not saying it must be, I'm saying it could be more than $10 per day, given that you don't know when exactly you are going to fall sick. And the day that you're going to fall sick could be an important and important day or important occasion of your life that you do not want to be sick on. Okay, so you might say that I uh, if I'm at, at home HBL, so this period I fall sick, also never mind. Okay, then another another one more interesting thing, this is off topic, but uh I, I, I don't know whether you, you you would or would not actually notice this and, and have you actually thought about that. Now with um with all these social distancing measures put in place, including this um, so-called DOSCON magenta, right? Not not quite red. DOSCON magenta. With this uh, circuit breaker measures being implemented, it, it is not just like uh, COVID nineteen that we are we are preventing. Oh, you realize that we will actually prevent a whole bunch of other infectious disease, including flu. So you probably wouldn't catch flu during this period of time. Okay. Anyway, uh, coming back. So. Your, your perceived benefits is here, but actually your actual benefits are here. It's because you guys are not taking the time to sit down to calculate your actual cost and benefit. So you are actually, you are perceiving your benefit to be lower than your actual benefit. You guys are all taking the A-levels this year. 
Okay, sorry, um, this is J, they are J1s, uh, they are J1s, they're not taking A-levels this year. For J2s, J2s are taking the A-levels next year. If you are taking the A-levels next year, okay, you should, there should, should be no doubt about it. You don't want to be sick during the A-levels. You should be taking the flu vaccination. So my suggestion to those of you who have not yet taken the flu vaccination and you're taking the A-levels this year, please go right uh, to, 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 to grab hold of the flu vaccination once it is possible to do so. Right, so your actual benefits are here. So you consume based on what you think should be the benefit. So you will consume here at the market equilibrium. So this is your demand, this is your supply, but your demand is based on your perceived benefit. Okay, but this is your actual benefit. So you should be consuming here. So because you are consuming at an amount that is actually in based on an in inaccurate amount of benefits, you are actually under consuming vaccinations. Okay, so you are actually under consuming vaccinations. All right, so, um, here's here's another fun fact. Okay, another interesting thing. Uh, hundred forty, about a, a, as of today lah. I, I just want to give you some sense of perspective. As of today, right, about two hundred thousand people worldwide have died of COVID nineteen. We don't have a vaccination for COVID nineteen. Nothing. We don't have a vaccination yet. In the year twenty eighteen itself. 2018, uh, so 2018 because this is the data that I found. 20, in the year 2018 itself, uh, 140,000 people died from measles virus. And guess what? The crazy thing, the crazy thing is that we have a vaccination. We have a vaccination available for measles. Okay, uh, I'm going to let you catch a video of myself. Get immunity from measles. 
and for reasons of vaccination, we find that this rate is 95%. So the chief herd immunity, we need 95% vaccination rate for measles. Now, who's vulnerable for measles? Actually, babies under one year old, they cannot take the measles vaccination, so they don't have a choice. You may want to have your kid who's below one year old have the measles vaccination, but they can't because the measles vaccination is only age appropriate for babies who have turned one. Right? So to protect these kids, these babies who are below one year old, the rest of needs to get vaccinated against measles. And this is a concept of foster vaccinations. So, from my point of view, measles vaccination is going to be significantly under-consumed if left to the free market, and that is why we should make sure that every single government in the world should make measles vaccination number one compulsory and number two free of charge. And that's it for today's episode of our 5 Minute Economics, and we'll catch you on the next one. Right, there's, there's actually quite a number of things I need to touch on for this video. Number one, um, we filmed this video in early in late January or mid, mid January. So that's why we call it Wuhan virus. This is for us back then where they have not developed the term called COVID-19 yet. So the term was called Wuhan virus and it was worldwide, including our government called it the Wuhan virus. So that's the reason why we use the term Wuhan virus. We filmed this video in January. Okay, the second thing uh, is that for this measles um, vaccinations being under consumed, there were two reasons that I point out. Today we are going through one of it, which was the imperfect information one. Alright? Um, the imperfect information one um, is because I told you for, for the specific case of America, right? Parents uh they have this conspiracy theory. Uh okay, sorry, the, the, the ones in the US is that parents they have this this theory that okay, if I if I get if I get my kid to go for measles vaccination, they will get autism. Right, so that, that is what they, they think will happen. So that's why they actually under consume measles. Um, in developing countries, right, uh, they, they, they it's, it's, it's even more crazy. They have these conspiracy theories going on that uh, the, the measles vaccination is some evil kind of thing from the government that the government trying to inject your body with. So um, that's also one reason why they under consume measles. It's all this are imperfect information. They're, they're not truly aware of the facts. So they make these wild conjectures about what what um, these vaccinations are for instead of actually really getting their kid to go for these vaccinations. So if, if, you, if, you, if you actually look at this video um, um, and, and you compare it to the rest of the other videos I have filmed, right, you'll find me a lot more agitated and angry and excited compared to the other videos. The answer is because right in the year 2017, right, there were 70 cases of measles in Singapore. Okay, So I think uh, in a year, right, a lot more people tell Toto than 70 people. Lah. Right, because you count the first group price, second group price, uh, I think in a year you will have hundreds or even thousands of people who strike TOTO. So uh, I think I'm luckier or uh, than, than striking TOTO. La. Okay, it's not me. I didn't catch measles okay, in the year 2017. My eldest boy, who is four years old this year, he caught measles in January 2017. So he was hospitalized for one week plus right, for measles. So he was one of the 70 cases. So the reason why he caught measles was because he hasn't turned one yet. Uh, in January, he was 11 months old. So he technically couldn't have gotten the measles vaccination. Right, so the second, the second reason why measles vaccination is under concern is because of the context of positive externalities. Now in Singapore, it is compulsory for us to actually go for uh, measles vaccination. So in Singapore, we are kind of protected. Okay, but we are not protected from two, two, two groups of people. Number one, tourists. Okay, who come from developing countries or in countries or developed countries that don't have uh, mandatory vaccination. So we get if the moment you get into contact with these tourists who have this, uh, who have who are carrying measles, you will, you will actually catch measles. So my boy caught it from someone. Okay, uh, or it could be also potentially, and this is more likely to be the case, is that I personally made a misinformed decision of bringing my kid overseas before they turn one. So in the future, please make sure you remember this uh, that from this lesson, if there's any takeaway from this lesson. Uh, don't have the wanderlust kind of spirit and don't have the YOLO kind of spirit when it comes to your kids. Uh. Before they turn one, uh, don't bring them anywhere. Make sure you keep them at home. Okay, because that would be a stupid decision to bring them overseas, especially because you don't know what are the immunization policies of the country, whether they have mandatory immunizations for disease like this. Right? By the way, if you're wondering what is the fatality rate, you, you know in Singapore, our fatality rate for um, COVID-19 has been like 0.1 percent or less right currently like at present uh, which is which is really really low uh the fatality rate for measles is 25 percent 25 
Okay, so measles is actually a very, very contagious, very infectious and very deadly disease. The only lucky thing is that we have a vaccination for it. So it's then bloody ridiculous that uh, despite we have, despite us having a vaccination for it, 140,000 people die from measles every year. But that's pretty crazy. Okay, so let's, 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 let's continue. Now, so let me, let me run through with you the cost and benefit analysis of going for vaccinations by parents. Huh? Okay, uh, this this uh, this is quite crazy. It's super duper crazy. It's it's very very Amor style. It's a very Western kind of uh, mindset. So they their cost uh, is like this uh, So um, you, you you watch you watch the way the American stock sometimes can be quite ridiculous on uh, Oh, it's my child's body. So we we they are not old enough yet to decide. So I don't want to violate their body. You know, an injection to their body is a violation of their body. So how ridiculous is that, right? So um, the, another one is that allergies to vaccination can kill him. Like um, the some some of these vaccinations they are they are stored with within egg protein. So some people are actually allergic to eggs. So that that could be a potential thinking which which is fair and valid. Now some vaccinations can cause autism. Okay, this is mis based on mis misinformation. Uh. Okay, so basically right um, there's this thing called. Um, regression analysis. I'm not too sure if 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 you if you are aware of this thing called regression analysis. But, uh, sorry, my wife is asking me whether I want to eat KFC and and I need to turn the volume off. <laughs> okay, so uh, the 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 report that we are talking about, right? Um, it is 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 super annoying. That that's why I think everybody should study economics. Everybody should study economics. Now, when I find a correlation between A and B, uh, that doesn't mean that A cause B. Like, for example, if I found a correlation on, like, um, uh, rainy days, okay, rainy days, and your exam scores, okay, if, if I, found, I, found, I found that on years that, that, that where there is actually more rain, Okay, the students did better at the examinations. And then I go ahead and say that rainy days, okay, cause exam scores to be higher. Then I make this correlation because I found a chart and then the chart moved in the same direction. I found two charts and then these two charts move in the same direction. And then I go ahead and make this make this saying and uh, make, make make this theory and say that the theory here is this is that if the when it rains more, okay, then it will cause uh, people to have higher exam scores. So this these two things are like I'm I'm saying likely, I'm not saying impossible. I'm saying likely to be unrelated. That means it's just pure coincidence. There are a lot of things that can move in the same direction. There, there are a lot of things that can move in the same direction. It doesn't mean that they are correlated. Right? So if I go ahead and say that, oh, based on these two correlations, I therefore make this theory and then I'm quite sure this is this is true and this is the law. So I make this correlation and say, oh, you know what? So uh, if training, uh, then uh, people cannot go out. Then they don't go out. You know what they do? Wow, they study. It's so raining are uh, very good because raining right people will study. If raining then people don't go out, they stay at home and study, then they, they do better exams. I I'm not too sure how true is that because uh, from the way I see I, I don't think right now HBL is having a positive impact on your studies. I don't think so, right? Is it having a positive impact or negative impact on studies? So uh can you give, show me a uh, we, we do a we do we do a polling using your, your hands. If you think HBL has been having a positive impact on your studies, uh, put a thumbs up. If you think HBL has been doing a negative, uh, has a negative impact on your studies, put a thumbs down. Come, let's go. Tuition, don't count. Uh, don't talk about tuition. Generally speaking. HBL impact on your studies. Thumbs up or thumbs down. Go. Some, a lot of neutral, uh, neutral, neutral, thumbs down. Okay, well, very, actually very mixed. Uh. Okay, so the, the, our conclusion is this, we cannot, we cannot make this conclusion about rainy days and the impact on exam scores because at the very least, right, your, your HBL is a bit like the, the, the theory that we talked about just now, which is rainy days lead to, lead to exam scores being better. I don't think that's the case. I think it's just a mere and pure coincidence. Okay, so we shouldn't make co uh, um, um, correlations like that. Okay, uh, so... That the some people are afraid that if if I if I take the measles vaccination for example I will get the measles because um some some vaccinations are based on inactivated version of the virus or lower dose dosage or lower dose of the virus 
right? And it can actually cause the virus to occur. Uh, well, I guess um, I, I don't know what to say. My, um, my when my kids, my kids, um, the 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 once one very interesting thing about it is that I don't know why I'm like always damn unlucky on uh, <laughs> super duper unlucky. Uh. So whenever we go for vaccination, the doctor will always say this: about five percent of the children who get this vaccination, they will have some symptoms like they will they display like uh fever or flu symptoms. Only he said only five percent. Wow, it's damn amazing because all my three kids, right, whenever they go for vaccinations, right, the, 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 the night, right, they will develop fever. So all my kids fall into the 5% range. All three kids fall into the 5% range. Okay, so um, it, it, it's actually not causing an actual manifestation of the disease. It's just that you get some mild symptoms because your mild symptoms are basically your immune system reacting to the vaccination, which is not a bad thing. It's supposed to be a good thing. Okay, because your, your immune system is actually developing resistance against the, the disease. Then the price of the vaccination, the pain, the discomfort, the time, and then um, your benefit is the lower possibility of contracting the disease. Now, so um, for a lot of people, they look at this cost and benefit table and they're like, ah, shit, I'm not going for it. I'm not going to go for it. And that's because they have a choice. Because in these countries, uh, the vaccination is not mandatory. So with the comeback of the measles uh, virus, a lot of United States... Uh, a lot of states in the US have actually put in state laws to make it mandatory for people to actually go and get these measles vaccinations. Okay? Right, um, so um, I'm going to try to get you to draw a diagram. So can you can all of you take some time to draw a diagram based on... So you use this, you use this like as a reference. Uh, use this as a reference. Okay, but this time round is different. This time round, right, your perceived cost is higher than your actual cost. How would you draw the diagram? Okay, I'm going to give you like three minutes to draw this diagram. This time round, your perceived cost is higher than your actual cost. So how would you draw this diagram? Take out paper and pen. Uh. Don't, don't, don't be lazy. Take some time to draw. Do some drawing, do some work. Okay, right, so for the measles vaccination, this is the diagram that I will draw to explain it to you. So your perceived cost, your perceived cost is higher. Your cost, perceived cost is higher than your actual cost. Because, because your perceived cost is higher than the actual cost, you consume based on your perceived cost and your, and your actual benefits and your marginal prior benefits. So you'll consume at QM. This is the market equilibrium. Your actual cost is actually significantly lower than what you perceive it to be. Your actual cost is actually quite low. So if you if you consume based on your actual cost and your and your private benefit, you will actually consume here at QS. 
So since QS is higher than QM, you are actually under consuming the measles vaccination. So this would be the explanation for the measles vaccination. Okay, why measles vaccination is significantly under consumed. Alright, so uh, did everybody get the diagram right? You got the diagram right? Good. Okay, so let's move on. All right, let's let's now move on to talk about smokers. Okay. Now um how how I will explain this um in terms of um how I'll explain this in terms of smokers um suffering from imperfect information is this. I'll say that for smokers, right, um it is not that they don't know. Okay, if, if you've been through the Singapore education system, at the very least, you will know that there are downsides to smoking. You know that uh, smoke, smoking affects your health, smoking affects your health in terms of your lungs, it affects... Um, so like for example, one, 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 one thing it actually affects is that if you're a smoker, uh, there's a higher fatality rate among smokers for COVID-19. The higher fatality rate is got to do with um, existing conditions with the lungs because at the end of the day, COVID-19 is a respiratory disease. So people who are, who, are, who are smokers are more susceptible to it. Sorry, let me just uh, close, go and close one window because notifications are a bit annoying. Okay, come back. So um, why, why, why do smokers actually suffer from improper information? It's because they tend to always underestimate the, the cost associated with smoking. Like what? Like, um, for example, if you actually smoked if you are smoking when you're young, okay, you're smoking when you're young, the, the, the things that happen to you tend not to be very significant. Um, when, when you're young and you smoke, you probably won't see anything that happens because the, the, the effects associated with smoking is accumulated. Okay, it takes time to actually show. So it's progressive. So the impact on your health is progressive. It doesn't happen immediately. So you don't actually quite see the things that they do to your health. So by the time you do actually see the issues associated with your health, you might be so addicted and so comfortable with smoking that you actually decide that uh, I, I'm, I'm going to continue smoking anyway, in spite of me knowing the issues associated with smoking. So most people actually tend to overconsume cigarettes. Okay, so um, you you will need, uh, today I'll, I'll hope that you can take some time to try out writing an essay, okay, to, just to practice. Because the language that you use in terms of explaining market failure or in, in, in terms of imperfect information is important. Like, are you comfortable with using these terms, margin private costs, margin private benefits, perceived costs, perceived benefits, and then uh, contextualize to the case of smoking. So if we had time, okay, I'll, I'll ask you to take some time to do this. So in a physical class, I'll actually go and walk around and see what you do, but this is not a physical class. So I'm gonna move on for now first. Now, last week, we covered externalities. This week, we covered imperfect information. Externalities and imperfect information are two completely separate issues. I repeat, uh, I one more time, uh, I say this loud and clear, make sure everybody gets it. Uh. Externalities and imperfect information are two completely separate issues. They are not related and they are not to be explained in the same breath. Okay, explain them separately because they are really separate issues. I'm going to explain this to you. Okay, um, how do externalities manifest themselves in cigarettes and why is there market failure in terms of smoking? Okay, let me explain this to you. Externalities is this concept that when I smoke, people breathe in secondhand smoke, so people's health are affected. Okay, so when I smoke and then I I I I, I cause other people to breathe in secondhand smoke. When I, I don't care. It doesn't matter whether I know or I don't know. It doesn't matter. Whether I know or I don't know, it doesn't matter because fundamentally it doesn't affect me, it affects others, so I don't care. And it comes with assume people are selfish, by the way. You don't assume people have a big heart. There, there's no reason to assume like everybody has a big heart and they, they care about people around them. No. And it comes with assume that human beings are rational and therefore selfish. Okay? So if we assume people are rational and selfish, Externalities is about the case of why cigarettes are overconsumed is because of that I smoke more than socially desirable because I don't care about the costs that I inflict on others. Okay? Imperfect information is that I smoke more than what is efficient because I don't really actually know how bad smoking is bad for me. I don't know how bad it is on my health. Okay? If I knew, like for example, if 
imagine um imagine ah uh, that that like for example for some reason right we uh all uh right I, 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 I don't know I, I I remember watching this movie when I was in secondary school or something like that it is a movie called Death Note do you all, you all watch it but I watched the Japanese one not the new Ang Mo English one so the Death Note there's this like this this like an injured thingy that you know he can see like he can see the age of the people when they die is it is it that, that's the movie right you all, you all watch this movie. So what what if what if everybody had the the power to see when they're gonna die, and how come they die, and then what if everybody had the ability to see like which how many years of your life is being taken away because of this action that you did if you had this information, so if you present to smokers this piece of information if it was even possible uh, if it was even possible you present smokers this piece of information a I can give you ten years of your life back, confirm plus chop. If you don't smoke, when 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 faced with certainty in terms of information, people will definitely reduce the amount of smoking. But we can't. There's there's no such information available because there's no such information available. People suffer from imperfect information, so they don't they don't make decisions based on what uh what is actual, but they base information on what they presently know, which is inadequate and insufficient. So they smoke more than what is efficient because they don't really know the repercussions associated with smoking to a very very large extent. Okay, right. So I, I guess uh, it's gonna rain, uh, right? So everybody's house is so dark, including mine. Uh, mine, mine is not dark because I'm in Jurassic Park. You know what? You watch Jurassic Park. You see, so it's not dark, right? So anyway, uh, if you like some nice virtual backgrounds, you can. Okay, uh, I'll share with them with you in Slack later, lah. Uh. Right, so uh, if your internet sucks, don't use virtual background because they will cause your 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 connection to like my internet is very powerful. So okay, <laughs> okay. So anyway, let's move on. Right, uh, so let's talk about vaccinations. Uh. vaccinations are under consumed because of externalities and imperfect information as well. And again, these are two separate issues. Externalities, when people under consume vaccinations, is because is because people don't really care. Uh, people don't really care about the fact that others okay have a lesser chance of um of catching a disease if you if they are vaccinated. Like if if I told you that uh you should get again this is this is super duper crazy. I don't know whether you know this and and uh, if you don't know I should tell you because it's good education to know. Do you know that do you know that um uh people can die from flu? Do you know that people do die from flu? Do you know that there are a lot of people who die from flu every single year. And do you know that the same groups of people who die from flu are the same groups of people who die from COVID-19? And do you know that the reason why people die from flu is because flu can develop to this condition called pneumonia? Okay, so when, when you have flu for a persistent long period of time, okay, it, it can infect the, the lungs more deeply and then you develop this thing called pneumonia. So pneumonia is um, the number one killer, number one elderly disease, okay? Number one killer of elderly. It's a disease that is the number one killer of, of the elderly. So uh, if, when, when you go for flu vaccinations, you are not only just protecting, the same logic with, with staying at home. When, 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 when you, you don't catch flu, right, and you don't pass it to people around you, right, and you don't pass it to elderly people around you, right, you are benefiting them because whenever the elderly catch flu uh, it's always always very dangerous for them because when they catch flu uh, and they don't recover from flu fast enough uh, it can develop pneumonia and they can actually die from it okay so um, the, the concept of externalities is because that you don't go for vaccination because you don't quite care that people around you will catch a disease especially if you're young and you're healthy you don't give a shit about people around you right when you're young and you're healthy you're like ah, you know even I catch never mind lah, three four days start at home so that's why your, your valuation of, 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 of you catching flu is, is very low, $10, you're, you're fine. Right, so, but, but the problem here is that externalities are that you will affect people around you. Imperfect information is because you don't know the benefits of vaccinations, that's why you don't go for it. Okay, like for example, um, I, I, I don't know how much is this still relevant um, to you guys, I, I don't know whether has this been made compulsory. Okay, so I count how many girls in this class one. Uh, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. Okay, so about half half the class, uh, 4, 14, I count, counted for this. So exactly half of the class today are girls. 
Okay, have you heard of this thing called a HPV vaccine? Have you heard about this thing called a HPV vaccine? For the girls, how many of you have gone for a HPV vaccine already? You have already got vaccinated against HPV. One, two, three, four, five. That's less than half. Six. That's less than half. Okay, for the other half, maybe let's educate you. HPV is um, a virus that causes cervical cancer at usually a later juncture of your life, like when you're in your 30s and when you're in your 40s. But um, if you can get the vaccination against HPV, you will reduce your chances of getting cervical cancer due to HPV to almost zero. I repeat, you can reduce your chances of getting cervical cancer caused by HPV to almost zero if you go for HPV vaccination today. Okay, maybe not today, like right now, because COVID. But if you have not gotten the HPV vaccination, then it might be a good time for you to go after this COVID-19 crisis blows over. Okay, so if you didn't know about this fact, then obviously you're suffering from imperfect information and that's why you didn't go for it. Right, your, your benefits are so high like, for this one. It's, it's eliminating one kind of cancer happening to you to almost zero. Like. And then your, your costs are so low. Your costs are so low because this one can be paid by Medisafe or can be paid by your parents' Medisafe, which is from their CPF. Okay, and um, it's, it's, it's really convenient and it's fast free, except that unless you're afraid of needles, then maybe that's one, one, one cost. But other than that, everybody should be going for HPV vaccination. Right, um, then let me <laughs> go through uh, this, this one more thing with you. So the guys, how many of you have gotten a HPV vaccination? Okay, again, um, yeah, wow, so rubbish, ah, cannot be, lah. in Singapore, guys don't go for HPV vaccination. Lah. Okay, so uh, unless you have a, the, 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 the common, but and again, this is a misconception. The common misconception here is that only if you have a cervix, then you go for HPV vaccination. Right, it, there are countries, if I'm not wrong, I, can, can, I cannot remember which country was, is it Canada or, or, this, or, or was it Australia? There are countries that vaccinate both guys and girls for HPV because uh, although HPV is something that affects more, more of women, guys can uh, be infected with HPV as well. Okay, just that it doesn't lead to cervical cancer because you don't have a cervix. Alright, so um, the, this is the issues associated with the difference between externalities and imperfect information. You must know the difference. Externalities is, I do this, something happened to some other person, I don't give a shit to some, some, this other person. It doesn't matter whether I know what's going to happen to this other person. It doesn't matter I know I know or I don't know. It wouldn't have fundamentally, fundamentally made a difference because I don't care. Okay, that is the concept of externalities. Alright, next um, is the concept of um, imperfect information. Imperfect information is got nothing to do with other people. It's got to do with myself. I under-consume or over-consume because I assume wrong information about the good that I am going to consume. So I think too highly or I think too lowly of the benefits or I think too highly or I think too lowly of the cost. That's why I under consume or over consume. That has got to do with the information that I have. I make a wrong decision based on the information I have because my information is wrong. So that's the concept of imperfect information. They are two separate issues. You've got to explain them separately. So please make sure of that. Okay, so um, let's, let's come back to this, um, this, this discussion of imperfect information. Now, we started on, on this topic on you know, whether or not we should, we, we, we should go for um, LASIK. Now, um, the answer that I will have for most people is that I will say that people have been, having, have been doing LASIK since the 1980s. Okay, uh, the late, late 1980s or early 1990s, people have been doing LASIK. And so since this technology has been around for some time, I will, I will say that it's relatively safe, okay? Because if there were any uh, repercussions or symptoms um, or any downsides of LASIK, we would have known by now because the technology has been around for 20 to 30 years. So the technology is relatively mature. So a lot of people have gone through it. So we have enough information to know that it's generally quite safe, that there are no significant side effects and repercussions. So I will say that it should be fine to go for LASIK. So, um, I don't think imperfect information is very significant today. But um, if we are talking about when the technology, when the LASIK technology just came out, it might have been quite a crazy decision to go ahead to go and do lazy because you know why? Because um, you wouldn't know actually what are the long-term repercussions to your eyesight. 
okay, or whether this 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 LASIK will have been long lasting or whether it caused any other issues. So we don't know. Alright, so back then, but now we know. So now we have proper information to decide on whether you know you should go for LASIK, and the answer will probably be yes. Okay, next let's talk about essential oils. Okay, so um I I I've 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 met a lot of people who 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 have um said that essential oils are good in many different ways. Okay, so like um let's let's have a show okay let 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 let's let's have a show of hands who who are users of essential oils again. Hands up. Or your parents are users of essential oil. Okay, now I would like you all to turn on your microphones and tell me what are the benefits of essential oil from your view or from what your parents have been telling you. Let's hear it. Okay, you can turn on your mics. I'm, I'm waiting to hear from you. Uh, uh, so, uh, essential oil. All right, you mean the one that you put in the diffuser, right? Yeah, they can be used as in a diffuser or they can yeah. be applied. Yeah. Uh, so it yeah, actually helps to you know, keep, the, uh, keep the room, uh, give it more of a better smell uh, than uh, helps you focus a bit more. Uh, that's all for me. Uh. Okay. Uh, what else? Come on, let's hear. Continue hearing. Let's hear a few more perspective, a few more viewpoints. Hello. Yeah. Oh. They just like the smell of the essential oil. Okay. So they just buy. Okay. Anything else? Not really, they just buy because of that. Not because of any health benefit or whatever. Okay. Come, come. I'm, I want, I'd like to hear more. I'd like to hear more crazy users of essential oil. Because my wife is one. My wife and my mother-in-law. I will tell you more about them. But but uh, I, I, I would like to hear from you guys first. Uh, they buy because the diffuser look nice. Any other reasons? Uh, no, just because it looks nice. Come on, come on. I'm sure there are other people who believe more in essential oils. Hey, I don't believe eh. Come, come, quick. More, more. Who else? Your family uses essential oil. And why do they use it? Anybody? Okay, so I'm gonna share my 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 example of um, essential oils. Uh. So uh, uh, for a few years back, um, there there was this case in in in, in my wife's uh, my wife my 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 mother-in-law. They had this case of on on essential oils. Basically, right? Uh, essential oils could cure headaches, they could cure muscle aches, they could cure uh, they could cure uh, abrasions, they could cure they could cure constipation, they could cure diarrhea, they could cure flu, they could cure uh, fevers. Wow, there, there, there is a type of essential oil for every single thing on earth. Okay? So uh I mean, for 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 quite some time. I mean, I, it's not that I don't I don't believe there are any benef that there are benefits associated with essential oils. Okay, but um, so this this really got to me when 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 uh, my my wife was actually looking at a manual or booklet that that her aunt gave to her. So she was reading out the booklet. So she was saying this. Uh, I'm not gonna tell you this. She was saying, uh, hey, she was, she was telling me this. Hey, you you see this this booklet? What it says? It says that if you drop a uh, a drop of this oil. A drop of this oil uh, into the toilet bowl water, uh, then your constipation will be cleared. So I repeat, uh, you drop a, a drop of the oil uh, into the toilet bowl, uh, then you will have no more constipation. Okay? Then um, whenever uh, anyone has flu, uh, so what, what happens was that they took this this oil called peppermint oil, so they will put this peppermint oil, they will put a lot, and then after that they will they put it on their their, their neck, their, their 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 nose and their chest. They will rub. And then um, then then I went to Google, I went to Google and then I found that um, by basically right essential oil right they actually concentrated they 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 call essential oils because of the word essence, and essence basically means concentrated, 
So I went to wheat, right? So actually, you're not supposed to do that because um, in, in, in quantities like that, they're actually poisonous. They're, they're as good as toxic and it can kill. Right, so actually essential oils, um, they, they, I don't know whether or not they work. I cannot, I cannot attest to that, okay? But if you ask me, um, people who use essential oils, right, they might overthink things. That means they might see the benefits associated with essential oil to be higher than the actual benefits okay so along along with this essential oil one um i'm gonna tell you this this what wow, this crazy thing uh have you heard of this thing called mlm multi-level marketing okay right uh okay so I'm going to ask you guys this question and then if you don't have answer to this question and your parents are at home, you can go and shout and ask them now. <laughs> okay? Right, uh, let, 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 let me ask you this question. Have, have, have you heard of this thing called deer placenta? Deer placenta. And then in Chinese, I don't, need, I don't know what, what they call it, but uh, in this MLM talks that I've been subjected to, they are called Tai Pan Su. Okay? So deer placenta, ah. Uh, Dear placenta, okay. So um um someone close to me, I'm I'm gonna I'm not gonna name name, someone close to me um uh got cancer a few years back. Okay, um it was stage two cancer a few years back. So there was this auntie that came that came and, and talked to us and then told us that uh you know if you take this dear placenta cells right, you will your cancer will be cured. Wow, that one mind blowing. I at, at 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 that particular moment, right? There was a innate uh desire in me, right, to punch the shit out of that person's face because it's bullshit. Is yeah, you are it's pure exploitation. You are feeding on people's fears because of their their they having gotten cancer, so they will believe anything that you say because they're desperate, right? They're desperate to get cured. Of cancer, so they listen to everything they say. So I want, I so want to punch, right? Uh, but anyway, let's just continue hearing the explanation out first, huh? So this this lady was telling me about cells. She was explaining to me science, wow, then powerful. So um, at a particular point, um, I was studying this thing called MCAT. I don't know whether you know MCAT is what well. MCAT is medical college admission test. Uh, I I I I do want to at some point in my life when study medicine when I have the time, and the money. Okay, but I was studying this, this thing called MCAT, so I'm, I'm fully aware of, of all your bio topics. Okay, so she was trying to explain to me about cells. So she was trying to go into an in-depth scientific discussion with me, trying to explain to me about cells. She was telling to me how cell death happens. Okay, and she was telling, she was trying to explain to me that, right, if you take these dear placenta pills, right, uh, they contain stem cells. So she said that these stem cells will rejuvenate the human cells. Well, you know how full of shit that is now. Uh, number one, uh, if they are in pills, these cells are dead. Right? <laughs> they are not live cells. Number two, uh, deer placenta cells and human <laughs> cells are two separate things. They are they're not the same. You can't use deer placenta cells and expect it to rejuvenate human beings. Right? So right, uh so there were this 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 whole this whole concept was so full of shit. Right, that um, I wonder how many people out there are being duped into buying this crap, this whole lot of crap based on this um, scientific, this so-called scientific explanation that um, dear placenta cells could cure cancer. So if you take dear placenta cells, according to her, these dear placenta cells will replace your cells that are cancerous and then, you know, you will be free from cancer. So that, that, that is for shit, right? But um, again, people actually overconsume these products because they are not, they, they don't know better. So their perceived benefits far outweigh the actual benefits, so they overconsume that. Okay, um, let's go on to talk about wet market and supermarkets. Um, today, I'm going to wet markets and supermarkets. Um, so, uh, this this is of course this is a theory. This is a theory that I have. Okay, I, I uh, from from how many of you watch the latest PM Lee's address? And the press conference, the latest one, the one that they tell you circuit breaker bloody extended. Which one? They all, they all watch. Hands up if you watch. Okay, that's like more than half the class. 
I, I don't know whether you caught some of these um, nuances, okay, some of these nuances in, in the press conference that I caught. Okay, first of all, um, the, the one conclusion that I drew was this. Um, I think it was attested to that. The reason why the, the foreign workers' cases shot up and are in thousands on a daily basis now because they have been spreading for some time. Right? Does that make sense? That, that was one, 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 one point that you can take away from the press conference. Number two, the reason why these cases weren't caught earlier was because they were asymptomatic. Okay? Because they were asymptomatic. Now, if you put two and two together, there was another thing. They say that MOH has been doing some testing. Okay? Background testing. Background, you know what's background testing? Background testing means they, they do random testing of people who are not suspected to have COVID. Means even this person not suspected of COVID, I test, test them anyway to see if there's any com evidence of community spread. So they, they, they found that there have been some leakages. That, that's the exact term used, right? They said leakages, right, into the community, right? Now, if you put two and two together, right? And then after that, you look at the measures that have been implemented, right? So they have put some, they have, they have put some measures on wet markets, right? Right? They put some measures on wet markets uh, in terms of social distancing, the, the odd number, even number, NIC number thing. If you put two and two together, right? My suspicion here is that I think that this is, I think, uh, I'm not saying it's the truth, uh, so don't quote me on this. Uh. I think that MOH already thinks that there is asymptomatic spread in the community. Okay? That has not been really picked up. And so, it could be the cases, it could be the case that there are a lot of community cases out there that nobody are aware of. And that's the reason why we are putting in these measures. If not, why extend the circuit breaker by a full whole month? So that is my suspicion. Okay, of course I cannot confirm it. I don't know whether that is the truth. But based on these pieces of information, this is decision making. Okay? This is decision making. Based on these few pieces of information that I have, okay, I put two and two together. I am going to categorically advise and I, was, I suggest you to do the same because you guys study economics. I hope you all don't be stupid. Okay? I will category, category, categorically advise everybody this, especially if you have old folks at home. Don't even go out anymore to crowded places. Don't go to the supermarkets. Don't go to wet markets because these are places where the most crops are going to congregate. If you can, buy online. If you cannot, then you go like them late at night. You go like super late at night to like, maybe if your house nearby got fair price extra. So I stay near Jurong Point. So my house nearby got fair price extra. So fair price extra, well, I'd be a bit tired lah. Maybe 2 a.m. go. Because they are open 24 hours. So go and do your shopping when there's nobody around. So if you can do that, you avoid catching the virus. Then you avoid bringing the virus back home and spreading it to others. And so since I've said this, if... You are old, that is where the greatest risks are. Because if you are elderly, you, you realize that all most of the deaths are for people who are above the age of 70. So if if um if you have very stubborn elderly grandparents, after my, my constitution class today, you go and give them a call and tell them stay at home. Don't go to the market, don't go to the wet market, don't go to the supermarket. Then you ask them, what do you need to buy? Tell me, I, I take down for you. Take down a whole list. Okay, be nice to your grandparents. Take down the whole list of what, whatever crap that they need. They need eggs, they need whatever, whatever they need. Ask them, tell, write down. Write down already, then go and Amazon Prime it for them. Go and rate mark for them. Okay, rate mark and Amazon Prime comes with free delivery if you order above a certain amount. Alright, so you can like one shot find out all the things that they need, order like maybe two weeks to one month supply and then avoid their chances of catching the disease by doing so. And now of course, if, if you have a elderly grandparents staying with you at home right now, then of course everybody should bloody stay at home. Okay, so the answer to this is that no, because of the imperfect information, we are going to over consume trips to the supermarket. We are going to over consume trips to the wet markets because we currently suffer from imperfect information. We do we our perceived costs, okay, of going to the wet market are actually significantly lower than the actual costs. Right? So here is basically a graph. 
trips to the supermarket is the quantity. Okay, trips to the supermarket is the quantity. Then after that, cost benefit is the axis, the, the y axis. Okay, we our perceived cost okay is currently lower than our actual cost. We should not be making so many trips to the supermarket, especially the elderly who have a higher chance of getting it. Okay, now next, lastly, um, I, I, I'm going through this because my brother just asked me this. I think he's very bored. I think he's at home and he's got nothing to do. That's why he's like, he's been asking me, hey, should I buy this or not? Hey, should I buy that one or not? Hey, he's not usually a shopper. I think he's really damn bored. <laughs> so he usually doesn't like shopping. So I think he's super bored. Then he's asking me all these questions. One day he come and ask me, Hey, should I buy a Dyson fan? The next day, two days later, he come ask me, Hey, should I buy a Dyson vacuum? So, uh, I, I'm going to explain this to you. Before I had kids, okay, I always found that people who buy Dyson fans are crazy. Like, their brain spoiled. That their brain really, really spoiled. Because, like, I, I cannot never, I can never understand why do you need to spend $500 on a fan? <laughs> right, uh, with all the discounts lately, it might be a little bit cheaper. Like, I think you can buy one for $250 now. Uh, now got discount, I think. Uh, you can buy one for a lot cheaper. $250, bucks, you can probably buy it. So, um, then you ask, then you, you, you should probably ask this. So, do I have a Dyson fan? Okay, I'm going to tell you this now. Um, you're going to be a little bit shocked. I have three. <laughs> so, if I think people who buy Dyson fans, they are crazy, then why do I have three? The only answer is this, is that I have three kids. And they sleep in two different rooms. And Dyson fan sucks. Then you say, hey, you crazy, eh? Dyson fan sucks, then why you still buy? Hey, the, the reason here is this, I buy because I think that there is a value to me. And what is the value to me? The one single value to me for Dyson fans is that they are bladeless. Because they are bladeless, my kids with their itchy fingers cannot destroy their fingers by placing their hands into the stupid fan. So that's the reason why I buy a Dyson fan that is bladeless. That's one. And then two is that some of these Dyson fans come with what? Air purification technology. My kid has a sensitive nose. He's allergic to dust mites. Like he's a severe allergy kind. Uh, he actually needs to carry an EpiPen around. If you're wondering what kind of allergy, allergic reaction he has. He's the very severe kind of allergic kind of guy. All right. So because of these two reasons, that's why I buy a Dyson fan. Okay. But if you ask me, who, will I recommend you guys, any of you to buy a Dyson fan? No. Are you Kids, do you put your fingers into your fans? No, you don't, right? And then two is that um, you, you, if you if you don't if you're not sensitive to, to 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 poor air, then you also don't need air purification in your room. So you probably don't need a Dyson fan. Okay, so um, a lot of people seem to overestimate the benefits associated with Dyson fans. So their perceived benefits is higher than the actual benefits, probably due to the aggressive and heavy advertising. So they tend to overconsume Dyson fans. So, um, well, this, this is one. Uh, I I don't. I'm not gonna speak about Dyson vacuum because I don't own one. Right, I don't own one. And then I'm definitely not gonna, not gonna talk about Dyson hair dryer. How many of you have a Dyson hair dryer? Hands up. Okay, if you don't have your parents' hair, also count. You have a Dyson hair dryer at home. Hands up. Go. Anybody? Okay, so 3 person have Dyson fan, nobody has a Dyson hair dryer. Okay, let's move on. Right, uh, I think it's a good time for us to take a short break, okay, before we carry on, because it's been, it's been a, a very long lesson. Let's take our mid-lesson break now. We'll come back in 5 minutes. You can turn on your web cameras and come back in 5 minutes time from now. Time now is 2.16, come back at 2.22, okay? See you guys in 5 minutes time. What food?
past nine plus and then I go. You do finish your I P at home? I want to finish my lesson planning for tomorrow first. What must I come to you? You Ten to four. Ten to four fifteen tomorrow. Say maybe before I go master class. Four three or four. I can't four to lesson for Right, uh, once you're back, you can turn back on your web camera so I know you guys are back and I can continue with the class today. Okay, once you're back, our map camera is back on so I know you guys are back and I can continue with the class. Okay, um still have like six or seven students not back yet, so Again, uh, if you're back, web camera is back on, so I know you're back and I can resume class accordingly. Okay, let's continue. Now, so um, asymmetric information is part of um, your imperfect information, is part of your information failure topic. But um, the difference is that when we're talking about imperfect information, it's a general, general lack of information that leads, to, that leads you to be... Um, that leads you to be unable to actually make the correct decision. There's a general lack of information that leads you to be unable to make a decision in an accurate and correct fashion. But asymmetric information is that between two parties, one side has more information than the other side. That is the concept of asymmetrical information. Okay, so um, the first thing about information asymmetry is the problem here I call the principal agent problem. Now, 
um, you will probably not be tested on the principal agent problem because it's not explicitly tested stated in your um, curriculum but um, this is the key kind of asymmetry information that we usually look at so I'm gonna explain this to you I won't take too long so let me first explain to you okay so um, first the, 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 the usual principal agent problem that I will use to highlight the asymmetric information problem is um, in the case of healthcare and in the case of doctor now, um, if, if you watch, uh, do any of you watch the medical dramas like House or used to watch medical dramas, any kind, Great Grace, Grace Anatomy, House or some Korean one like Good Doctor or whatever, you watch medical dramas and stuff. So if, if you realize um, uh, medical dramas, a lot of it always, they always revolve around ethics. Okay, what a doctor should do or what a doctor shouldn't do. They will always revolve around some recurring uh, theme of ethics about how there's, there's morality involved in terms of being a doctor and how there's ethics involved in terms of being a doctor. The same applies to lawyers. Uh, doctors and lawyers in general, they have this problem called the principal agent problem. What is the principal agent problem? Now, we start first by looking at your perspective of um, as a as a patient, okay. What as a patient, right? What 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 do why why do you go to a doctor? So um, at this point, you can join the discussion. Huh? Um, the microphones on. Uh, just 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 go ahead and talk. Microphones on. Um, why why do you see a doctor? For what you see a doctor for? Medical advice. Huh? Need to what? Medical advice. Okay, so why, why, why would you need uh, medical advice from the doctor? What's the reason why you need medical advice from the doctor? Because they are like qualified to give you the medical advice. Okay. And then like you want help. Okay, fair and, and definitely definitely correct. That's what that's what I would say as well. So if you think about it, right? Uh, if you got like a random headache that's not too bad, what will you do? You self-medicate, right? You just take Panadol, right? Correct not? And then if you like a minor flu, like very minor one, you feel that it's very mild, you don't want to see a doctor either, right? You Again, you self-medicate, right? If you can. Uh. Well, only when you feel like, eh, what the hell is this? Uh? How come am I not recovering? Uh? Why am I, why, why my fever so high? Uh? Or it's something that you don't know. It's something that you don't quite understand. Then you feel that uh, you don't have the answer to this. Then you go and see a doctor to find out why. So, in other words, uh, you're right. You go and see a doctor because you want good medical advice. You want good treatment options. You want to know what's wrong with you and you want to get better. Okay? Uh, so, this is one perspective. Huh? Right? Um, well, here's, here's a problem. How many of you have actively put yourself in the shoes of a doctor? I think very few of you would have bothered putting yourself in the shoes of a doctor because it's just weird to go and put yourself in the shoes of a doctor but if you put yourself in the shoes of a doctor you will realize that there is a very interesting situation going on hmm so let me let me ask you this this question uh. if you were a doctor in the private sector uh, what is your interest huh? what what are your interests as a doctor in the private sector let me give you just, just get you to think a little bit. What are your interests as a doctor in the private sector? Anyone, come on, go ahead. Turn on the mics and tell me. If you were a doctor in the private sector, what are your interests? Hello, come, try, engage in some critical thinking. You make profit. Why, why you like that? Why you make this kind of straightforward assumption that they want to make profit? So can you elaborate? Yeah. I mean, it's private, so their uh, uh, main object is to profit maximizing. So how ah? Uh? So what, what what he wants to do? Can you simplify it to more simple language? Make money. So what do you think? Do you think doctors in the private sector want to make money? Do you think doctors in the private sector they do they, do, they, do you think they want to make money? Uh, yes. I think other than making money, it's also to you know. Uh, make a living out of their profession. Uh. Uh, so, how are uh, like that? Which, which one should I, if I'm a doctor in the private medical practice, uh, what should I do? I've got two, two conflicting priorities, uh, it, possibly conflicting priorities, okay? The first conflicting priority, the first priority is 
to take care of your health, correct? To take care of your interest because that is a doctor's ethical uh, promise. What they 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 swear right to save lives, right? Right. What what's the that is the what the Hippocratic oath, right? So they they swore to save lives, right? They should put your interest as the first and foremost of their considerations, right? But being a private practice doctor also means that they have an extra objective. What's the extra objective? Just now, what, what, what did Alfred say? What make did profit. Make, make profit. Make money, right? So, right, right, I've got to take care of interest and I've got to make money. How are? Uh? Can you think of any scenarios where these two things are at conflict with one another? Go, go, come on, think about it. Hello? Like some doctors will like over prescribe the medicine, give you more services that they can earn money from. That, that will make sense, right? If you want to make money, that will make sense, right? So, uh, tell you treatments you don't need. Give you medication that are more expensive. Not necessarily more, more medicine, but maybe more expensive medicine that is not required. Not say not required, like maybe there are a few options. Got expensive one, got cheaper ones. But the cheaper ones, you don't make so much profit. The expensive one, your margins are higher. So maybe they recommend you a higher, a higher margin one, eh? Why not? So how are that? What do we do? What do we do? Okay, I want I want to tell you I want to share with you one more thing. Uh, I call it the aircon man, the aircon man, air dash con man. Okay, I call it the air dash con man. All right. Uh, so. I think about about seven years ago, so I had this aircon contractor uh, do what my, my house air conditioning. So at a particular point in time, so I just left them to do the air conditioning. So you know one one thing about one difficult thing about the air conditioning is laying pipes, the aircon pipes in your house. You know right? Aircon need aircon pipes, right? How many of you your aircon pipes always congested? That means always need to get people to come and service if not your aircon leak. You know it, how many of you got aircon leakages problem? You means your aircon always leak. Hands up. Wow, I got one, got two. Okay, if if uh, if you have the same problem as me, uh, I, I tell you what could be potentially the problem, uh. You know aircon pipes, right? Got 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 uh got got thick pipes and got very thin pipes. So if they install the very thin pipes for you, right, your aircon will get congested with a lot of particles, a lot of dust and dirt and whatever. And then, so you, you will need to service every one, two or three months, depending on how, how thin the pipe is. So my, my, my guess, my guess is this, my guess was that um, when these aircon guys installed the aircon pipes, they deliberately choose the one with the thinner pipes, the thinnest pipes, the smallest pipes, so that the aircon will always purposely be congested. That means the, the congestion will happen at a much frequent basis. And then you know, so when your aircon is congested, who you do who you get to come back to service? The same guys. So they can make more money. Right, so the this 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 example and scenario that I'm giving to you is how some okay uh, unscrupulous people make money. Right, if you think about this, this is in the case of an aircon. But what if you put it in the context of healthcare? How are well, it's actually them scary to think about, right? What if you were deliberately not being given the best treatment options, but you were being given more of the most expensive treatment options rather than the best treatment options because uh, between uh, maximizing profits and maximizing your welfare, um, the private practitioner chooses to maximize their welfare than your welfare. And to be honest, it's really hard to you know, fulfill this kind of ethical promise, isn't it? If nobody knows. Okay, so if you think about it, then you, you say, Alama, wow, like that, la, how ah? Why 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 should I go to the private sector doctor? Right. Uh, I will tell you say that okay, there is also the reverse problem being true la. Why is the reverse problem being true? Okay, let's let's again I'm I'm not I'm not discrediting um Singapore's healthcare system. I actually think Singapore's healthcare system is fantastic. 
um, the examples that I'm referring to today are more of your other developed countries and actually even developing countries. I think in many other countries, right, whatever I'm describing might probably be true. I don't think that is the case in Singapore. I think in Singapore, our doctors are generally number one, quite competent and number two, quite ethical. I think Singapore is a great place to have healthcare, to receive healthcare. So please don't mistake my intentions. I'm definitely not referring to Singapore. I'm referring to other countries. Okay, when I'm, I'm giving these examples. But I mean, anyway, um, specific to uh, a country with free healthcare, and I'm not going to name which, which country. Yeah. Doctors work ridiculous long hours. They work like 16 hour shifts. Okay, 16 hour shifts. Uh, means one shift is 16 hours long. Uh. Okay. No, so if, if you were a doctor on your uh, first hour, and, or you are a doctor in your 15 hour, you are completing your shift already, uh, and you see a patient, uh, and then you saw that the patient actually requires surgery, uh, then it would be best if the patient had surgery right away. Best, best outcome for the patient is have surgery right away. But it wouldn't hurt that much to have the patient tomorrow, where it's done by somebody else. And not you. Okay, but the they will increase the risk. Uh, that means the patient is exposed to long uh, 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 a greater risk uh, because the, 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 the surgery is delayed. Ma. Which one will you choose? If, if you're a doctor, who, you're a surgeon who is in the public sector, the, your pay doesn't change regardless to the number of surgeries that you do. And you are like half an hour towards the end of your shift. What are you going to do? Will you recommend that the surgery be done by somebody else tomorrow or will you do it for the patient right away? You, are on, you, you, have, you have completed a 15 and a half hour day. Eh? You are about to end your shift. Eh? This will prolong your shift by another one and a half hours. What will you do? Okay, if you are ethical, if you choose to prioritize ethics and the patient's welfare, you will say, I'm going to do it. Right? But if you choose to prioritize your own welfare, you will say, ah, let, let the next guy do it. Do you realize how problematic this is? So the principal agent problem, okay, is it basically lies like this. Um, in, 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 in a typical market transaction, things are quite wonderful one. Why things are quite wonderful one? So um, like 90% of you in this class today, you are actual students. 10% of, of you guys today, you are here on a trial, I think less than 10%, there's only like two or three students here on the trial today. The two or three students who are here for a trial lesson today, okay, you have every possibility of walking away from tuition, the possibility of taking tuition right after this lesson, and nobody can force you to pick up tuition. It's your right to choose to take up tuition with us, or it's your right to say, nah, I don't think I need it. The power is entirely in your hands, right? So. Um, the consumer has some power, the producer has some power. We only do what is in our best interest. So only if you feel that, okay, this lesson is useful, you weigh your own cost benefit, then you decide, okay, I'm going to take up tuition. Or no, I, I don't think I need tuition at all. I think this is not useful for me. So I choose not to take up tuition. This decision is fully in your hands. Okay, I play no part in the decision. Right, but that is the, 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 the wonderful thing about a market transaction. A market transaction um, only takes place if the consumer is willing and the producer is willing. The crazy thing about a doctor-patient relationship, why we call it the principal agent problem, is that you give up this power as the consumer to the producer. That is the crazy thing. So you are, you are tell, when you go to the doctor, you're telling the doctor to make the decision on your behalf. You're saying that, hey, actually, I don't know what is best for me. Okay? You're telling the doctor, hey, I don't know what's the best for me. You decide for me. You realize that that is the case of a doctor and a patient relationship? You are ceding this decision. You are giving up this decision, this choice to the doctor. You are saying, hey, I don't know better because I don't know better. You are the best person to make this decision for me. So you go ahead and make this, this decision for me. Okay, but when that happens, then of course, the, it, it is down to the doctor okay, to decide whether the doctor is going to maximize his own self-interest or your self-interest. And that's the reason why there may be the problem of under-consumption or over-consumption as a result of information asymmetry. Okay, so um, that, um, I, I better stop here, principal agent problem, because that's not even uh, really explicitly tested. The next two things are explicitly tested. So I'm going to go through that. Okay, so moral hazard, moral hazard, and then you read the, the subheading. Okay, you want to make a guess what is the star, 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 star? 
Eh, why you why you shout it out? No shout it out. I never say it's that word, right? So uh, that but basically, why are we such star 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 star? Is is the the summary of this topic called moral hazard? Okay, we human beings are really quite crappy beings. Okay, why are we such crappy beings? Is because of this thing called moral hazard, which I'm going to take some time to explain to you. Okay, so um, here's here's a question for you. Do you think that healthcare is expensive in Singapore? Do you think healthcare is expensive in Singapore? I mean, don't don't talk, take into account like government subsidies uh, If like government subsidies don't exist uh, like chars uh, polyclinics uh, don't exist uh, Okay, do you think healthcare is expensive in Singapore? Okay. healthcare is actually quite expensive in Singapore, and uh, medical inflation has been going up at a rate like far higher. I cannot remember which year was it. Was it two or three years ago? The medical inflation was about ten times higher than the the the, the consumer price index which meant that medical inflation was very, very high. And one reason why medical inflation is very high is because of moral hazard. So I'm going to take some time to explain the concept of moral hazard to you. So first, okay, I want you to put yourself into this position. Uh, okay, so assume... Okay, let's, 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 let's put it this way. Huh? So assume that... Uh, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going to tell you which example am I basing this example from, uh? okay, I'm not going to tell you which example am I basing this on, uh? you can make a guess, but I'm not going to tell you, uh, because it's a hypothetical example, uh. it might be based loosely on a true story, but I'm not going to tell you, uh. okay, so let's say, uh, hypothetically, uh, you, you have had um, consecutive headaches, not consecutive headaches, you have been ha having ongoing headaches daily, okay, for like the last five years of your life, Okay, and you have only decided to see a doctor uh, after five years of having the headaches every day, which is actually a very stupid idea. And then after going to like two or three GPs, their, their conclusion is to tell you, you need to go and see a specialist. Okay, so you go and see a specialist. So you, you, should, you should notice how this story is weirdly with a lot of details. Huh? Okay, so make a guess. Huh? Right, so, uh, so you're going to go and see a specialist. Okay, then you go after seeing a specialist and telling... Uh, the specialist, your symptoms, right? The, the, the specialist makes a conclusion. Hey, he said there are two possibilities, right? Why you're having uh, a headache every day of your life. Number one, you have a tumor in your head, okay? Or, and, and it could potentially be cancerous, okay? But I say based on your age and your profile, the chances of that is like maybe very low, maybe like 5% or less. So you say, wow. Very, very low, it's just very low, it's quite, quite unlikely, like you have no other health conditions, so your chances of having a tumor in your head is about 5% or less. Then after you say, the other, the, the, the likelihood and that that's going to be 90% plus of the, the time is that it's because you, number one, you don't sleep enough and number two, you overwork. Okay, so the person, the person in this, in this uh, hypothetical example works about, about 100 plus hours uh, at this particular point in his life, 100 plus hours per week. Okay, 100 plus hours per week. And then so the doctor said, the neurologist said, hey, it's actually most likely of the overwork. It's that uh, too tense, too, too, too little sleep, too much work. So that's the reason why daily headaches. Okay, so after that, um, the doctor then went pro proceed to, to, to say this. Okay, um, well, the, since there is a small chance, okay, there is a small chance, we should proceed to do an MRI. And a, a, a CT scan, so we should check uh, an MRI of your head, your head, and make sure that everything is fine. And then uh, that will require a hospital stay of like one night. Okay, one night, All right? So what, 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 what this would cost? It will cost about three thousand to four thousand dollars. Oh, I want, I want to have a show of hands. How many? So, so like the doctor said there are two options. Number one. You can go for uh, MRI right now to, to, to confirm that you don't have a tumor. Number two, you can go back and then try for the next one month, reduce your workload by about 20%. Okay, and take uh, more sleep and rest more and take a break. Uh, and then you come back again. If you take option two, then no need to go for the MRI yet. No need to go for MRI yet. Huh? So, but if you go for MRI, you must pay money. Huh? 
So how many of you will say, okay, I, I'm not gonna take a risk. I will, I will spend the four five thousand dollars and I'll go for the MRI. Hands up. How many of you will spend the money and go for the MRI? One, two, three, four, five. Okay, about five six. How many of you will try for one more month first? That means you will take the doctor's advice. Don't spend the money. You will, you will try it first. One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, so more than half the class. Okay, now I'm going to give you um, an add-on to the scenario. What if you had insurance and because your insurance, you had insurance, that means to say no matter what, your cost is zero. If your cost is zero, how many of you will go for the MRI? Okay, so good. So that's practically everyone. Hey, basically, right, you guys have just committed more hazard. Those of you who say, I will go home first and then I'll try it out. Then the moment you say, it's not my money. It's not my money. I don't need to spend money. You say, okay, chong ah, let's go. Let's go for the MRI. You guys have just committed more hazard. You made a different decision just because the cost wasn't yours to bond. Okay, it wasn't yours to bear, sorry, not bond. It wasn't yours to bear. So you 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 would have gone for it just because you didn't need to pay for the cost. Okay, that's moral hazard. Okay, so moral hazard actually means that um you 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 act differently because um the cost were not imposed on your on your end. And this is the, the issue associated with healthcare insurance. So when people have healthcare insurance, there are a few problems that we call moral hazard. Why why we explain this moral hazard problem is because uh why is there more hazard is because you will have actually over consumed healthcare. You will have over consumed healthcare services because you pay nothing for these healthcare services. So you will tend to overuse these healthcare services even though they in under normal circumstances you were not a paying party, you will not have used these healthcare services. So because of that, a lot of people in Singapore have full healthcare insurance coverage. So they will just go for these options if they can, because they don't need to pay a single cent. Okay, and then this will cause demand for healthcare services to go up. So this is demand for healthcare services that is more than your usual amount of healthcare services demanded for because you don't pay for the cost. That's one. Two, okay, uh, people who have healthcare insurance, they tend to actually engage in more risky behavior and more unhealthy behavior because they know that they are covered by healthcare insurance. So any cost associated with damage to their health is not being fully borne by them. It's borne more by the healthcare insurance provider. So this is the concept of moral hazard. Moral hazard means acting differently because you don't bear the cost associated with the action. Does that make sense? Okay, that's the concept of moral hazard. I'll just go through one last thing today and before we come to an end. Okay, um, the last eight information asymmetry uh, example that we're going to touch on is adverse selection. Okay, we're going to talk about this thing called lemon cast. Okay, uh, in, in a world where there are good cars and bad cars, I think this will make sense. If you are a buyer, you will definitely be willing to pay more for a good car than a bad car. Does that make sense? So if, if, if the same model, but um, one car is in mean condition, no defects, one car is in terrible condition, a lot of issues and there's defects, you'll pay less. So you'll pay significantly less, 20k less. Okay, would that make sense? Hey, the problem in real life is that uh, there is almost no way of knowing the truth. When you go to a car showroom and then you go and buy a second-hand car, you don't know what defects are there in the car. Okay, you don't know what defects until you, until you have driven the car for a few weeks, then you will know what defects there are. Okay, but you don't get to drive cars for a few weeks before you get to buy them. You buy them, then you, you get to understand what kind of car it is. Okay, so that's the problem. So, um, okay, so, um, your, your, your learn stats already, you know, in, in math, have you learned stats? Okay, you have learned stats, but if you take A math, do you know the concept of expected value? Hey, if your chances of getting a good car is 50%, and then the chances of getting a bad car is 50%, good car, you are ready to pay 70k, bad car, you are ready to pay 50k, uh, yeah, correct, 50k, so you realize you take 70k times 50%, plus 50k times 50%, then the value you will get is 60, 60k. So it, in a world where you don't have information about whether a car is a good car or a bad car, a buyer is only willing to pay the expected value for a car. Does that make sense? 
So you're only willing to pay 60k for a car because you don't know whether is it going to be a good car or a bad car. So you pay the expected value of a car, which is 60k. And the problem with this is that if you were a good car seller, if you know your car is worth 70k, you won't be willing to let go of the car at 60k. So good car sellers will exit the market. They'll say, ah, screw you, man. I'm not going to let go of my car at 60k because my car is a good car. So I don't want to sell to you. So the good car seller, they exit the market. They say, like that, I'd rather keep the car. So what is left in the market will be bad car sellers who are willing to sell at 50K. They say, why wow, you willing to pay me 60K when my car is only worth 50K? And then will, will bad car sellers be honest? No, we assume people are selfish. They are rational and then they are selfish. They will keep quiet. They will shut up. They will not, they will not say anything bad about their car. So they will, they will sell their car at 60K, um, even though their car is only worth 50K. Then eventually what will happen in the second-hand car market is that there will only be bad car sellers left. Okay, there will only be bad car sellers left. So if there's only bad car sellers left, then you're paying 60k for a car. Then in the end, this market, this, this, this entire market is going to collapse because eventually buyers will realize that there are only uh there are only there are only bad cars available. There are no good cars available. So no no buyer will be willing to buy anymore. So the entire second-hand car market collapse and crashes okay so that is the concept of ever selection and why it leads to market failure all right um in in your textbook there should be another example about about healthcare insurance and smokers so that one you can take some time to go and read uh that, that will be another example would, which will help you understand and explain the concept of ever selection but more hazard and ever selection are basically two different types of um market failure relating to information asymmetry that you need to learn. The principal agent one, that one is just good to know. We don't know whether it will be tested explicitly. It is not stated in the curriculum, but uh, you never know. Okay, so um, if you have no questions, then that's all we have to cover for today. Okay, on information failure. So if you have any questions, I have about five minutes before I need to conduct my next class. So if you have any questions, then um, of course, feel free to turn on your microphones and go ahead and ask before we end. So if you have no questions, then uh, you can stay behind. Uh, so if you have, you have questions, you can stay behind. No questions, feel free to lock off. Okay. Um, yeah. Bye, Mr. Toho. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye, Mr. Toho. Thank you. Bye-bye. See you. Yes. The first data is same as the Wednesday class, right? Yes, it's the case study lesson. Okay, thank you. Welcome.